Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Pastor Amos. Welcome to St. Luke Garland Online. Listen, take this moment to share this broadcast. We're going to have a special service today. We're so glad that you've tuned in. We thank you for all the prayers and support as we are dealing with this difficult time, but we're still going to have a good time. This is the day that the Lord has made. We have come to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, let's get ready for worship.
Hey, family, it's offering time. Listen, we are having an amazing Sunday thus far. Thank you, Praise Team, for that awesome worship experience. Listen, we are so thankful for St. Luke Garland. We are thankful for each and every one of your givers and sowers and prayers and supporters of St. Luke Garland. We are moving forward. Yes, we are experiencing a few setbacks, but God is still a good God. Listen, this is your opportunity to give. And we have three ways you can give. You can give via our website, www.stlookgarland.org. Or you can go through Cash App, which is dollar sign S-L-A-M-E-C Sowers. Or you could just mail it to our address that will be provided in the slide immediately after we pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning. God, we thank you for each and every giver at St. Luke Garland. Those who can give in their time, their talent, and their treasure, we thank you for it all. God, continue to provide, give us comfort, give us peace and strength in this time and season. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and your love. And it's in your name we pray and say, amen. Listen, family, we have an amazing preacher in the house virtually on today. Yes, we have Reverend Sean Nickelberry, the executive pastor of Wesley Chapel AME Church in Houston, Texas, where the pastor is Reverend Dr. Leo Griffin. Listen, he's preparing a mighty word for us. Please, please buckle up immediately after our worship selection. You're going to hear from our very good friend, Reverend Sean Nickelberry. Got a story to tell you about some things that I've been through, but I'm here. Oh, I'm here. Had some sun.
morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. I don't know about you, but I've made up in my mind that I'm going to rejoice and be glad. My name is the Reverend Sean J. Nickelberry, and I'm the proud executive pastor of Wesley African Methodist Episcopal Church in Houston, Texas, under the leadership of our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Leo Griffin. First of all, to God, I'm grateful for another day and for this opportunity to be chosen to speak his word and for his people. To my very great friends, Pastors Amos and Jasmine St. John, thank you so much for affording me this opportunity to come into your virtual sanctuary to share with the wonderful people of St. Luke Garland. To those that might be connecting via Facebook, YouTube, or however you connected, I don't think it's by happenstance that God allowed you to join us today. So thank you so very much for your prayers and for your encouragement. Let us go to a very familiar passage of scripture. I invite your attention, if you go with me, to Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And from the New International Version, you'll find these words. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So for the few moments that we share together, I want to encourage you with these words, purpose in your pieces. Purpose in your pieces. In fact, encourage someone, put it in a chat, text someone, there is purpose in your pieces. Now declare it over your life. Lay your hand on yourself and declare there is purpose in my pieces. My brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, Christians in every generation have found immeasurable comfort in this magnificent promise and truth that we just read in Romans 8, 28. This text is surely one of the best known texts in all of the Bible. On, on it, believers of every age have stayed their minds, uh, found peace and hung their hope. Again, I'll say it again. On it, believers of every age have stayed their minds found peace and hung hope. And here in this epistle to the Romans, composed by the Apostle Paul to explain that salvation is offered through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we find a word, a text that is surely one of the greatest promises of God to his people. The Apostle uh, encourages his audience by reminding them of one of those things that we know. In this case, we know that God works all things together for the good of believers whom he has called according to his purpose. Even if we don't go any further, you ought to be encouraged to know that God works all things, not some things, but all things together for the good of believers whom he has called according to his purpose, those whom he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So we note that verse 28 begins with the statement, we know. Uh, verse 22, if you read back, began likewise with the term we know. And so here we find one of those statements of Christian knowledge. And yet there are many things we do not know. For example, as found earlier in Romans 8 and 26, the word says we do not know what we ought to pray for. So in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weaknesses. I read in the word somewhere where it says in our weakness, his strength is made Perfect. That's a reminder, brother and sisters, that there is purpose in your pieces. Amen. So we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. And I'm so grateful that even when I don't know the words to say, even when I don't know what to do, even times where I can't even clap my hand, lift my hands, even when there are times where tears just fall freely, the God that I serve understands the language of my tears. So even when I don't know, I know that God is at work. So in fact, my brothers and sisters, I contend that we are in a continuous tension between things that we know and things that we don't know. Amen. In our text this morning, Paul lists five truths about God's providence, which we do know. Amen. First, we know that God works. 
God works. God works or God is at work in our lives. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances look like. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It does not matter where you come from, your economic standing, whether you're his, uh, whether you're Republican or Democrat. No matter what the case may be, God works and God is at work. Secondly, we know that God is at work for the good of his people. Yeah, there's a caveat that God is at work for the good of his people. And I'm so glad that I made up in my mind a long time ago to declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm, I'm so glad that I'm saved to know that I'm a part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm so glad to know that I'm a part of his people. And I know because of that, God is at work for me because God is at work for the good of his people. Thirdly, my brothers and sisters, God works for our good in all things. The interesting thing, and this is a spot where you can rejoice. In fact, a man goes right there. God works for our good in all things, even those hurtful things, even those trying things, even those difficult circumstances. God is at work in all things. My brothers and sisters, I don't have to remind you or tell you that there is nothing beyond the overruling, overriding scope of God's sovereignty and his providence. Amen. Back in the day, they would say there's nothing too hard for God. So thus, all that is negative, all that might not be going right in life, even that is seen to have a positive purpose in the executions of God's eternal plan. Fourthly, God works in all things for the good of those who love him. Yes, for the good of those who love him. And I'm so glad that I love God and I know for a fact that God loves me. This is a necessary limitation to point out because God's objective is our completed salvation. Then it's as beneficiaries, if you would, are his people who are described as those who who love him. We are reminded of this in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 15, for it says, if you love me, keep my commands. Oh, yes, there's something that comes along with it. You can't get the benefits without the responsibility. So we're reminded in John that if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Uh, filthy, those who love God are also described as those who have been called according to to his purpose. Even though we've messed up, even though we've fallen short of the glory, even though that we're wretched sinners, we have been called according to not your own agenda, but to his purpose. So God has a saving purpose and is working in accordance with it. Life is not this randomness, this random mess, which sometimes may appear. Life itself can be likened and compared to a jigsaw puzzle. But I'm here to encourage and let somebody know that no matter what you might be going through, there is purpose in your pieces. So in researching and studying our text for the morning, we find that God does not promise to bring good to us in every situation and circumstance. I wish, my brothers and sisters, that I could tell you that you're going to get good out of everything. In fact, that doesn't happen. In fact, the word tells us in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, uh, that in this life, we're going to have some trials and tribulations. We're going to go through some things. That's pain. That's difficulties. That's circumstances. But we can be of good cheer because God has already overcome. The word also tells us man born of a woman is a few days yet full of trouble. My brothers and sisters, we're going to go through some things, but I learned that God does not promise to bring good to us in every situation or circumstance, but I can guarantee you he's at work in the midst of it. So, so, so as a chef uh, combines ingredients to prepare a delectable dish of food, God uses and mixes all the circumstances and situations of our life in such a way that ultimately yields a beautiful experience. Independent of each other, the in ingredients might not be that good, but when you learn how to put it all together, I've come to appreciate the fact that when you learn how to mix all your experiences, all of your circumstances, the finished product is better when it's all mixed together. Thus, I'm left with something good. My brothers and my sisters, it is important that I point out a common misunderstanding of this promise. Many, if not all of us, have probably heard, probably ourselves, applying Romans 8.28 out of context. 
Yes, you might have lost your job, but you can be sure that you're going to get an even better one because all things are working for your good. Or don't be upset about your significant other walking out on you because God must have had an even better life partner for you. After all, Romans 8 and 28 promises us that all things are working for your good. The issue and difficulty with this understanding and finite application is that it interprets uh, good from a very narrow and a very often materialistic perspective. Amen. From God's perspective, good must be defined in spiritual terms. The ultimate good is God's glory, and he is glorified when his children live as Christ did and attain the glory that he has destined for them. So as we have seen in Romans 5, 3, and 4, not only so, but we also glory, watch this, in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. God uses suffering to build Christian character in us, conform us to Christ, and prepare us for final glory. What he promises us then in Romans 8 and 28 is not that every difficult experience will lead to something good in this life. The good God may have in mind may involve the next life entirely. He may take us out of a secure, well-paying job in order to shake us up of this materialistic lifestyle that does not honor biblical principles, and we may never have a good job again. He may want to set us free from a connection or a relationship with someone because he wants to use us in a way that would be difficult or even impossible being connected to something and someone that would block or hinder his purpose in, for, and through us. Hear the words found in Romans 8 and 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed, my brothers and sisters, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So we must remember that it is by sharing in Christ's sufferings that we will eventually be able to share in his glory. I'll say it again, everything ain't going to feel good, but when we learn how to rejoice and share in the sufferings, we'll eventually be able to rejoice and share in the glory as well. And so my sisters and my brothers, my brothers and my sisters, this is not to say that material blessings cannot be included in the good of Romans 8 and 28, we can find several instances in both the Old and New Testaments that make clear God delights to give his people good things in this life as well in the next. But it is detrimental to our physical and most definitely our spiritual well-being to make this text be an ATM for good, for every possible thing that we encounter in life. Life can be much like a puzzle, and we go through many pieces, and even though we don't always understand, know where they go, or know where the pieces fit, or even appreciate the trouble we go through to understand how the pieces even fit, the fact is, all of the pieces of your life are still necessary. You ought to encourage yourself, put it in the chat, text somebody, there is purpose in your pieces. In fact, declare it over your life, lay your hand on yourself, and declare there is purpose in my pieces. We read a little further in Romans, in Romans 8, 35 through 39, for it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, mm -hmm. uh, uh, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Know in all these things that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Our Lord, the uh, apostle insists that nothing that believers encounter, nothing that you go through will be able to separate you from the love of God. Uh, my brothers and sisters, nothing will touch our lives that is not under the control and direction 
of our lovingly Heavenly Father. You remember the story of Job, right? And I want to encourage you, nothing will touch your life that is not under the control and the direction of our loving Heavenly Father. Everything we do and say, everything that people do to us or say about us, every experience we will ever have, all are sovereignly used by God for our good and for his glory. We will not always understand how the things we experience work to a good, and we will certainly not always enjoy them. But we do know that nothing comes into our lives that God does not allow and use for his own purposes. So in this puzzle of a life, there is purpose in your pieces. When we learn how to take the good along with the bad and know that God is still in control of it all, we can rejoice in the fact and still be able to shout, thank you, because another thing we do know is that is purpose in your pieces. I believe that Paul wanted to tell believers not how they became Christians in the first place, but rather how God always had a plan to get believers to the finish line of working all things together for good, showing them how they'll be able to persevere through whatever trials they may face along the way. And in Christ, we have a glorious destiny. And Paul will go on to stress no outside power, no circumstance, no degree of suffering, no temptation, no person, no thing can rip them from the firm grip that God has on their lives. And so here it is. He is working things out for good in every stage of our lives and is still doing the same today. My brothers and sisters, I promise I'm almost done. So in this text, we learn that Paul further describes those for whom God works all things together for good as people who have been called according to his purpose. This calling is according to God's purpose. And when we see Paul using the word purpose, he does not, uh, he does so usually to emphasize that things occur by the sovereign will of God. It becomes clear then that the aspect of God's purpose Paul has in mind is conforming believers to the likeness of his son and having called and justified them to bring them to glory. What Paul has in mind regarding the good news towards which God makes all things uh, work is then made clear. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So in this world where believers groan inwardly as we await uh, the adoption that may, that, that may come to help relieve us of the experience of suffering and persecution, God in his sovereign power makes even these things serve the end of our conformity to Christ. This is what God has predestined for those whom he foreknew, each and every individual believer. And it is definitely significant and important to note for believers to be conformed to the image of Christ, one must be transformed. Amen. To be conformed to the image of Christ, one must first be transformed. I'll say it again for the people sitting in the back or in the other room. In order to be conformed to the image of Christ, one must first be transformed. So Paul's words found in this text give us a glimpse into the understanding of predestination. His primary purpose was to provide comfort and encouragement for vulnerable believers caught in circumstances and exposed to suffering and persecution. They ought to know, and you ought to know, that the Holy Spirit comes to their assistance, comes to our assistance by his intercession on their behalf, and that God works with the Spirit to make things work for the ultimate good. They ought to know also that as those whom God foreknew and predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, having been called and justified, they will also certainly be glorified. As I previously uh, have mentioned, we learned from this text five truths about God, which Paul writes, we know. We do not always understand what God is doing, let alone welcome it. Nor are we told that he is at work for our comfort. But we know that in all things, he is working towards our ultimate good. And one of the reasons we know that this is we're given many examples of it in Scripture. For instance, this was Joseph's 
conviction about his brother's cruelty in selling him into Egypt. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for my good. We can also look at the weeping prophet Jeremiah uh, writing in God's name a letter to the Jews in Babylonian exile after the catastrophic destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I'm not much for puzzles. Don't have the time or patience to sit there, but I know that you need all the pieces in the box to enjoy a satisfying outcome. In many ways, life is like a jigsaw puzzle. We spend our days putting it together, hoping to create a beautiful, meaningful uh, masterpiece. But when we can't find the strategic pieces that complete the puzzle, some of the challenging situations in life, we face unsettling disappointment at best and at worst despair. The truth is that life can be confusing. Life can even be lonely. Life can feel meaningless and empty, full of puzzle pieces that just don't make sense or puzzle pieces that we don't understand. Disappointment and despair ought to be expected as normal products of our experience. Let's face it, there have been times when we wonder why life is not more rewarding. We challenge serve life, if you will, looking, hoping, searching for something to catch our attention, only to end up bored, jaded, and flat, stuck with another out of peace, out of place puzzle piece. And when life gets in your face, we are shocked at how brutal it can be. We wonder why, what's missing. And for many of us, God seems to have been removed as the preeminent center of our existence. The most important piece, can I help you brothers and sisters, the most important piece to the puzzle of our lives is God. In fact, he is the puzzle designer. And when God is banished from human uh, experience or relegated to the religious margin of our lives, left only to serve us on an at call basis, we become functionally alone. And in the aloneness, in the emptiness, and in the vulnerability, we become more philosophically uh, theory. We are uh, not experiencing all that God has promised for us. But my brothers and sisters, I want you to, to know and I want to encourage you, no matter what you go through, no matter what this puzzle of life has given you, there is purpose in your pieces. The good news is, while we have life and breath, God will not cease to pr pursue a rewarding relationship, de de deepening intimacy with us. He is not content to leave us known. His unceasing, unconditional love for us compels him. He longs, my brothers and sisters, for a relationship with you. He wants to meet you at the intersection of every dream, every desire, every choice, every thought, and he urges us to turn toward him and actualize this finished work of his son, the gift of the spirit and the resource of his word. So what do you do when you can't pull all the pieces of the puzzles of your life together? You turn to the designer and he will show you that there is purpose in your pieces. My brothers and sisters, there are purpose. There are purposes in everything that you go through and there is purpose in every piece of your puzzle. There are some pieces to the puzzle that we don't understand and we may never understand. But I go to sleep at night because I know who my God is and I can sleep comfortably because I know who God is and because I know who he is. I can go to sleep at night singing. I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. How do you know this, Sean? Because God is real. His grace is sufficient. His love is everlasting. His power is unlimited. His wisdom is perfect. His name is great. His strength is perfected. I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter how the pieces of your puzzle might look, something good is going to come out of this. How do you know? Well, the hymn writer said it I like this. I've seen the lightning flash and I've heard the tongue the road. I've felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer myself, but I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me to fight on, preach on, pray on, serve on, lean on, give on, love on. He promised never to leave me, no, never to leave me alone. For all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. There is purpose in your pieces. God bless you and keep you is my prayer. What 
an amazing word, Reverend Sean. Thank you so much for sharing that word. Listen, this is an invitation for those who want to accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Also for those who want to rededicate their lives to Christ on today. Listen, it doesn't take much. All you have to do is share this prayer. Repeat after me. Come on and say, Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me. I repent of all my wrongdoings. I now acknowledge you as my personal Lord and Savior. I acknowledge that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross, but get up with all power in his hand on that third day. I now confess and profess that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. And therefore, I can say that I am saved, I am saved, and I am saved. Hallelujah. Listen, you said that prayer for us today. You have made that decision. It's a special day. Come on. It, the, 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 the angels are declaring and partying for that one soul that has turned their lives to Christ today. Now, if you made that decision, come on, mention it in the comments. Or you can email us at info at stlukegarland.org. We would love for you to just let us know and walk with you in this journey. Now, if you want to, you're looking for a member uh, to be a member of our church online and or in person, because we are coming back together in person soon. Please let us know in the comments that you want to become a member of St. Luke Garland, virtually or in person. Or you can email us at info at stlukegarland.org. Reverend Sean, my God, my God, what a word. Thank you so much for sharing that word. It's an on-time word for such a time as this. We appreciate you for tuning in on this day. We thank you so much for praying for Pastor Jasmine and I as we're going through this difficult season. But we're still going to have church, y'all. We're still going to press forward. We're still going to make, make efforts into coming back to in-person worship soon. Listen, continue to pray for us. Uh, we will share the information on the service that will be happening on this following Saturday, uh, July the 31st. We would love to see you there. If not, it will be uh, happening virtually on Facebook and on YouTube. And we make sure to let you know on what page, on Bishop Vash Simon McKenzie page, and we will share it on our St. Luke Garland pages. Listen, we thank you again. We love you. We appreciate you. Continue to pray for Pastor Jasmine and I and Bishop Vash Simon McKenzie during this difficult time. Uh, uh, Supervisor Stan it was uh, a major supporter for St. Luke Garland. He was one of the biggest St. Luke sharers every Sunday. He commented, he showed love, uh, he loved his daughter, he loved his son in love, and he loved his church. We appreciate your support. Continue to pray again for our Bishop Vashti McKenzie as she is a, a, a experiencing this difficulty along with the family. Uh, Pastor Jasmine and myself and the rest of the family. We know that God will comfort us during this difficult time. Thank you again for supporting and praying and encouraging. We love you and we will see you next week. <laughs>